Um, my name is Taryn Hart, and I'm with Occupied Media, and I blog at plutocracyfiles.com. And I'm Chitao. I sort of work under my own sort of pseudo press organization called uh, Occupied Citizens Media or Occupied Citizens Press. Uh, there's sort of a group of ad hoc uh, citizens journalists who are going to be putting together sort of uh, the CMG, uh, uh, and it'll be the Citizens Media Group. Uh, so hopefully we'll be getting together and uh, all of us will be sort of legitimized under our own ad hoc ways so, uh, somewhat soon. Okay, and, and what's your Twitter handle? I think most people know you by that. Yeah, my Twitter handle is at punkboy in sf p u n k b o y i n s f i also do uh my own independent uh, uh streaming out of uh ustream.tv slash occupy sf but i'm not officially with any of them i do all this independently for the most part very good and okay so who's going to be a part of this uh and I, I what was the name of the kind of overall group uh, well, it's going to be Citizens Media Guild. They've just started putting this together over the last two or three days, so I, I, I don't even know if I should be throwing it out yet, but okay. I, I know that we're going to be putting that out soon. Okay, very good. So, uh, it's me. so far, it's like me, a guy, and a couple of guys in Australia, and uh, I think maybe one guy in the UK, and then hopefully uh, Oak Horse Show. Right. Uh, Spencer will probably be part of it, and uh, we'll be putting together our own little guild soon. Awesome. Um, okay, so why don't you uh, just tell me where you, how you got started with the Occupy movement, and then how you got started streaming? Well, let's see. I'm going to sort of backtrack to about 1996 because, as I've said a few times on my stream, I think the Occupy movement is sort of the next step of what has been going on for the past 30 years uh, with the Rainbow Family and the Rainbow Gathering. Um, I think there's a lot of similarities, and a lot of people haven't really made the connection yet, but what the Rainbow Gathering has been doing is sort of, you know, a lot of those Grateful Dead people that used to go on tour with them and everything, uh, they, they sort of have made this family, and it's uh, based on an old uh, Native American prophecy that says something about when the Earth is dying and, and the planet is ravaged, there'll be a new group of people that will be known as the Warriors of the Rainbow, who will come from all races, all creeds, all colors, uh, and who will fight for economic, social, uh, environmental justice. Um, and so what the Rainbow Family has been doing for the last 30 years, either in regional gatherings or the big national gatherings, uh, at least the one in the U.S. is held around uh, the time of July 4th. And so instead of celebrating the Revolutionary War with fireworks and, and whatnot, they come together and they occupy the national forest. They set up tents in and in, in sort of like an ad hoc community of like 50 to 100,000 people, depending on how many people show up. Um, and they basically do the same thing. There's drum circles, people feed each other, there's tents and little villages. And Know. So this is sort of like a political offshoot, I think, of the Rainbow Gathering, even though a lot of people don't really realize it. But so that's I, I went to my first one of those in 1996 in the uh, in the Mark Twain National Forest in the Ozarks in southern Missouri. It's one of the most beautiful things I've ever had a chance to experience. Uh, so as far as Occupy Wall Street, the first thing that I'd ever heard of them was actually I, I'm uh, sort of a sympathizer with the anonymous activists. And the first thing that I had heard was a, was a video put out by Anonymous on YouTube that they were going to be occupying Wall Street. So I originally had thought that it was just Anonymous doing this, sort of uh, like they had the Operation Bark here after they shut down cell phone service. Right. Um, so, so I started following them a little bit heavier after that, and I was always sort of a tech geek, and I followed Buzz Out Loud on CNET and, and uh, uh, Leo Laporte's Twit Network and all them. Uh, but so I'd heard that they were doing that in Wall Street, and when I heard that they were going to be sprouting up uh, a camp and camping out in front of the Federal Reserve here, I decided to uh, empty my cupboards with all the surplus food that I had and brought down two big bags of food and my puppy, who I'll grab and show you. All right. So I brought my filbert down, oh. and uh, <laughs> and filbert went down to uh, to drop off a bunch of food just to support the kids who are going to be camping out there and, and protesting all the all the uh, plutocracy and the money that's been going on over there. And uh, within 20 minutes after dropping up the food and talking to the people for a little bit, the cops showed up and right here to uh, to uh, sort of be a buffer between uh, the, the protesters and and the Department of Public Works who were in charge of basically just throwing away, or I guess some of the people got some stuff back that day. Oh, uh, right. was, uh, yeah, it was October 5th, and I, right. I, I had my cell phone on me, and I knew I had the Ustream app, and I had started an account way back when, and I never really used it. Oh. And I just picked up... I just picked up my phone and, and videoed it out, and within the next day, I had people following me on Twitter, and I just fell into it like that. Oh, wow. Okay, and that was at the Occupy San Francisco? 
Yeah, that was at the 101 Market, the original protest camp that's, that's been retaken last night. <laughs> Right. I don't know if you followed what we did last night. But, I did. Uh, I did. There were talks of raids. They barricaded around it. Yeah, and so what they've been doing is uh, little by little they've been taking away the Sordo Satellite Camps. The original 101 Market Camp was taken away a few weeks ago. What they called the Tent Bridge, which was basically a line of tents that went down that block between the 101 Market and uh, Justin Herman for having Manning Plaza. Uh, so they've been taking out those in little small strikes. Uh, but last night, uh, they had dropped off and sort of basically put up uh, offensive barricades along Stewart Street uh, at the foot of market around the Justin Herman camp. Oh. Uh, uh, am I frozen, too? <laughs> yeah, you're looking frozen. Oh, there you go. Uh, oh. uh, so, yeah, so last night, uh, under rumors of raid, everybody was wanting to not get raided, and, and they thought that that was sort of the precursor to the raid. Mm-hmm. So they took it among themselves to uh, snip the zip ties that were holding those together and sort of took it out. And they went and they took them out at 101. So as far as I know, uh, as of last night when I left, uh, the, the, camp, the protest site in front of 101 Market is back again with the information table and all the stuff about how the Federal Reserve is sort of breaking the country. Right. Um, so, and the first time I remember seeing you was the Cal Raid. Yeah. Uh, so the way that came about was, uh, you know, I, I sort of gave the people my number down in San Francisco and told them if they ever needed to. I covered the two raids in Oakland previous to that, and for a long time, up until Tim Pool started streaming up out of Zuccotti, like I was sort of the most viewed occupied person on Ustream. Right. I think I, I think my video, the the first Oakland raid, is still up at like 102,000 views after the live views. That's just as a as an archived video, it's over 100,000 people. Okay. So and this is so the first raid is the one where Scott Olson was injured. Uh. Well, he wasn't injured in the raid. The raid happened at 4.30 in the morning, and the people that were there, uh, Scott Olson was injured the next day, so basically everybody came to, to sort of protest the raid that, that oh, night. Oh, right, okay. And that was going to turn into sort of hell on earth in the streets there. Right, right. Right, and so, right, and then I, I saw you with the Cal raid. And, and so what are you using equipment-wise? You started with uh, your phone... I start, well, I, I still use the phone for the most part. Oh. I started out with, with an HTC Droid Incredible, uh, which I'd had for about a year, year and a half already. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I put a call out on Twitter that, I, that, that if anybody has like a spare 4G phone and somebody basically put, put, uh, added a line to their account and sent me down this HTC Incredible for, up from uh, uh, somebody down in Southern California. And so, basically, any equipment that I've needed, people have been so supportive in providing it because I am yeah. on a fixed, I'm on a fixed income. I, I am HIV positive, so I kind of do this at my own peril and, and without any money. So, all the support that I've been getting from everybody is very appreciated. Yeah, like, I don't have a donation site. I just, uh, I but you know, as soon as I got this phone, apparently the batteries from the old model don't work with this one. So people have been like walking up to me as I'm streaming, going, "Oh, here, you still need batteries? Give me extra batteries." So it's been it's been amazing. How do people donate if they want to? Can they just contact you through Twitter? Uh, yeah, they can contact me on Twitter, the at Punk Boy NSF. Uh, the only thing I I I I know that I could sort of use is sort of like an Android three point one, you know, uh, an Android uh, tablet, uh, so that I can easily type out long form a little bit more. I'm going to start a Tumblr soon and start getting back into uh, writing. Because uh, I was sort of uh, a mass communications major before I dropped out of community college, but I only did new reviews back then. <laughs> Very good. Well, like I said, I saw you with the Cal Raid, um, which oh, was... So how that, yeah, so how that came about was uh, I was walking my dog, and we were at the park, and I saw the tweets coming out, that they, uh, and just basically still shots. I hadn't even seen that video that went viral later on of them getting jabbed, or as the cops call it, nudged with their batons. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but I heard that that went down and that they needed people, so I just hightailed it over on the bark train and uh, was there for the evening and got to see their first GA. It was very beautiful to be there for their first sort of day of occupation and their first general assembly and explaining to everybody all the, the hand signals and everything. Right, right. I Yeah, what I, I remember, um, you know, watching your stream and the violence breaking out um, and you calling for a medic and trying to get you know, people over there, it was really incredible, like, I really, and you were also really reacting to the police that were there. I've tried to tame that a little bit, (laughs) but it's hard, it's very hard for me to sit there as a human being and watch these kids get their heads beat in and not call the cops out on it, and, uh, 
And I don't know if you watched uh, any of Spencer's feed from Occupy Los Angeles on the uh, whatever I that did. was there Wednesday night. They had they had a, a, one of those beanbag rifles pointed at his head, and that made like Russia Today and everything because like that's just, that kind of stuff is just uncalled for. And these cops are not really trained to think anymore. They're not trained to be community officers. Like Joe Rogan said, they're trained to like take out these perps and not take crap from anybody. And the people who are sending those people down with that mentality to deal with us are the people who are really responsible. So I'm very conflicted on how I feel about cops. Cause, you know, I, I know that they're just trying to do their job, that they're just following orders, but, but that's not really an excuse to me. Uh, I, I just I, I want them to really start thinking for themselves and not just blindly following these orders because they, they have to realize who they're hurting. And, uh, I'm, I'm hearing that there's rumors of, of, of some of the rank and file sort of questioning the orders to come down and raid us in the meantime. So I'm hoping that we might have our little, you know, it didn't really work out well in the long run in Egypt when the army sort of joined with them, but eventually right. we found out. Uh, but, you know, that, that I'm hoping that San Francisco police are going to be the first ones to sort of tell them to, to, to F off when, uh, when, when the order finally comes down. Right, right. Yeah, so, and, yeah, do you consider yourself um, a protester, a journalist, or both? Uh, I, I sort of guess I'm both. Uh, I did an interview earlier this week with uh, Jenny Jardin of Boing Boing. Uh, and uh, she had done a piece for the Madeline Brand Show on, uh, I guess it's syndicated through NPR, but through uh, Southern California Public Radio. And uh, she was asked that question of us. And I, I think we all do. I think I do. I think of myself as a journalist and uh, that I'm sort of, as she spiritually aligned with the movement, along with uh, Tim Pole and Spencer and, uh, and all the people. The other thing that's been really cool is there's a lot of people when I'm down at the occupations. They, they, they recognize me by voice because I'm not really in front of the camera as, I, right. as I'm streaming. So they see me, they see somebody with the camera and they recognize my voice and they walk up to me and they go, you're the reason I'm down here. And just, no, I'm not doing this out of ego. I'm just doing it because it needs done. And it's like, there's been this whole, this whole shift in, in mentality of, uh, of the media that they're just doing what the cops tell them. Uh, in New York, a lot of, a lot of press were treated very, very harshly. They were thrown to the ground. They had their credentials pulled off of them. They're like, oh, but I'm pressing. I'm not today, buddy. And then had stuff ripped off in their neck. And we're, and we're sort of roughed up. Even uh, someone, I think she was with the uh, New York uh, State Supreme Court, was like sort of uh, pushed up against the wall, and, and he's honest, Rodriguez. So, I mean, like, there's this whole disrespect of, of the eyes and ears that are supposed to be keeping. I think Spencer put it well in, uh, in uh, an interview with uh, KPFP uh, down in uh, Southern California, where he said, we're, we're sort of the buffer that keeps the cops in check when we're there with the camera. It gives them pause, and, you know, before they point that, that tear gas or the pepper spray at somebody, you know, they know that they're going to be held accountable because a lot of us are there with our cameras. Right. You know? And uh, there, there have been two press liaisons in Oakland who have treated me with a lot of respect. Uh, uh, officer, I, I don't know if he's just an officer or sergeant or something, but Chris Fulton and, uh, and Thomason in Oakland, who have let me into two of the press conferences in Oakland. Even when uh, all I had was my camouflage and basically what I've been calling myself the sort of the Occupy Citizens Press, mm -hmm. and I used to just have it, uh, I got the old sign there, but I used to just have it duct taped made with Sharpie on my back. Uh -huh. and, 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 and Chris Bolton was the first guy that said, basically, he's like, we have a, a laptop with Wi-Fi, I just want to verify that you have an outlet. So I gave him my Ustream address, and he verified. So I was able to get into the press conference the morning after the first raid in Oakland, and the first one when Jean Kwan came back from her little trip of, uh, of whatever trade uh, back back to our agreement she was making in Washington and wasn't even in town for the, the horrific way that her citizens were treated by her police department. Yeah. Um, and I even got questions in, like I was the second question at that first press conference. And, you know, I always try to conduct myself as professionally as possible and I'm led into events like that. Uh, but, but I think it was Thomason who came to me after the second press conference and said, and pulled me aside as the press conference was over and said, you know, I respect what you're doing a little bit more than these guys because they're going to edit it down to a couple of 30-second sound bites and you actually put the whole thing out there for everybody. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I've been, I think it's, um, I think it's really changing everything, the live stream and the Twitter feeds that are going on live as it's, it's happening. Well, yeah, and because it's you, I, I sort of have to make sure that we use the word you stream. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. 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 Well, at least for us with the mobile devices. And, right. Uh, and they've donated Spencer a live pack, and uh, they've also sent one out to Tim Pool to make sure. They, they were actually about to give me one, and then the Zuccotti raid happened, and he had that 
you know, all those 250, or was it 25,000 people watching him that day. So the one they were about to hand me uh, to cover San Francisco went out to, that, to him. But me and Spencer work as a team now. We sort of, even before, I, I started before him, it was like October 5th was the first day when I just fell into it uh, at that one-on-one raid. And uh, so me and Spencer have sort of worked as a tag team. Either we make sure that somebody's covering the stuff that happens in the Bay Area. Since, but even even before we met, his first day was uh, the day of the general strike where I had spent all of my battery power for like it was darn near 10 hours that I streamed of all the marches and, and Angela Davis speaking and all those. All the, it was just a wonderful day. Mm-hmm. And when my batteries finally went dead, I hopped down on BART. And then when I got home and turned on the TV and saw how south it went with the fire in the street from the black block or whoever did that, right. um, and he just happened to be there that day and turned on his phone sort of the same way and gathered a huge following for himself. Right. Um, so even before we knew each other, we were sort of doing tag team coverage. So right. we'd become right. good friends. We went down to the, to, to L.A. together. Uh, so we, we sort of make a good team, and everybody sort of thinks, Everybody goes, oh, you're like the West Coast version of Tim Pool, and we're just like, well, we're doing it since before him, but right. you know, people sort of call this like the trifecta of Citizens Media in, in Occupy, and there's all these people who've been inspired to do it, like uh, uh, Freedom. Freedom, so, right. Yeah, Occupy Freedom LA, we met her at Cross Expo, and she's been uh, streaming out. Uh, there's a few more that I kept off the top of my head, but yeah, those, those people in LA just sort of watched us and sort of... Uh, uh, you know, the more eyes, the better. That's, that's how I look at it. And uh, we're, you know, with the with the, the media guild that we're trying to put together, hopefully, they'll give us a little bit more of an air of legitimacy. Right. Yeah. I. Um. Yeah. All right. So I'll back up. So there's. Um. You corrected me rightly. Livestream is a brand. I guess is a is a is a, is a, a the uh, name a, of a, a service. PC based. Yeah. It's a PC based service. They don't make a mobile app, which is why a lot of us use Ustream because oh. they don't. Have, the live stream people don't even make a mobile app. To their discredit, I mean. Yeah. But there's there's a lot of people on live stream who do mirror our U streams when it goes down, and there's a lot who's been since day one mirroring all of us. And so when the stuff goes down, it goes it gets mirrored up on the live stream uh, uh, through Global Revolution. Right, right. Global Revolution's live stream, and so. Yeah. Yeah. And um, because they're also allowed to, but it's also easy for them to sort of do uh, screen captures with the live stream uh, platform as well. So. Right, right. Okay, and then you mentioned Spencer uh, several times, and we introduced him a little bit earlier, but he Twitters as Oak Show. Yeah, and he's, uh, it's he ha- O-A-K-F-O-S-H-O. Right, and he now has a website. Um, For his donations and, and everything. So he, he's basically quit his job. I mean, he's not really out to make money out of it, so all the money that goes there, he's going to be setting up a transparency page to show what he spends money on. It's basically going to be food expenses, travel expenses, He's going right. to set up something separate for his equipment, but it's basically to pay his rent to keep him going, and you know he's going to be doing this as a job. So, right. And so the two of you, um, when the Occupy LA uh, raid was looking imminent, went down to cover it. Yeah, and uh, it confused a lot of people who went to our channels. I saw people in my chat room going, "LAPD is illegally moving in on San Francisco." Oh. But, you know. <laughs> We're sort, of, we're sort of just uh, based out of those cities, and so we, we, we uh, you know, I think me and him are going to be covering a lot more. I think he's, uh, I, I think we're planning a trip down to uh, the Rose Parade because they're planning on occupying the Rose Parade to get a little bit more uh, exposure. Uh-huh. So I, I'm hoping to be going down there with him for that too. Anything else coming? Any, any? Where else are you guys going with it? You're going to obviously keep covering <coughs> Oakland, San Francisco, Berkeley, anything in the Bay Area. Yeah, I, I still haven't made it up to, uh, I know USF and SF State both have uh, little things going that I haven't made my way to yet, but I'm going to try next week to get down, uh, uh, over to those since they're in my home city uh, uh-huh. and give them a little bit of coverage. Uh, I also want to make sure uh, that I get up to UC Davis because I, right. I covered those kids a little bit. Uh, at least I live tweeted and uh, did a little bit of, because uh, a lot of those kids that got pepper sprayed were here two days before that. They we, they had all planned uh, because of the raid at, uh, at Occupy Cal that night that I was covering their GA and everything. They, that night they had started planning a general strike, and the day of that general strike was the day that they were going to come out the next day to protest the uh, UC uh, Board of Regents meeting that was happening at uh, UCSF Mission Bay campus. Right. Uh, and those cowards canceled the meeting that day, but they had already had the buses chartered and everything, so they still all came from UC Davis, UC Santa Cruz, uh, SF State, USF. So a lot of college kids came out to protest those tuition hikes. 
And that very same day, the Cal State Board of Directors or trustees or whoever they are, uh, uh, they sort of hid a 35%-ish increase as a 9% increase because tuition went up by 9% for the year of the semester, but it also put a cap on credits, which meant that you couldn't get your degree in four years. You had to do it in six. So even though it was the 9% increase per year, you're adding two more years onto, onto, your, onto your college course in, in the meantime. Uh, but those kids that came out that day and protested them, we went to the state building on Golden Gate, uh, where, which is where I finally met up with them when they got there. And uh, they popped up those tents inside of the B of A downtown here. And so those, it was a lot of those kids that got arrested at that, uh, a lot of them from uh, Santa Cruz, but some from Davis that, that got arrested. And then two days later were pepper sprayed at their own college. Right, right. Yeah, definitely in an iconic um, moment, one of the defining moments. Um, I definitely, you know, the first, the first one I really remember watching on a, this was on live stream, it was Global Revolution and through Twitter was the Brooklyn Bridge, the 700 arrests on the Brooklyn Bridge. And since then I've caught, uh, most of the big ones. I did not catch the early Oakland ones. Like I said, I saw you with the Berkeley raid and I watched the coverage, um, that, uh, I, I mainly watch. I know you were there too, and, and I, I think you got kind of shuffled off to a different area. I mostly watched Spencer and Freedom. Um, oh, in LA, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and also, what happened to us uh, in LA was Spencer ended up because he, he had sort of a fake, you know, uh, press pass that he had made uh, that sort of got him in there. Right. Uh, so it was kind of our little experiment because we knew that that media pool was going on. So I was torn, like, do I do I go to Pinko's or FedEx office or somewhere to really quick, like, to print one out and make one? Right. So I, so I, I mean, it wasn't really planned, but it was sort of in the back of my head, like, I'm not going to wear any credentials because I want to see how I'm treated uncredentialed or, you know, without a, without a, a sort of official-looking pass. And he'll have the professional equipment with professional pass and see how he's treated. So it was kind of, like, in the back of my head, sort of a little experiment to see how how they were going to deal with press because that that 15 person press pool that was only allowed behind beyond the scenes and they only told the mainstream to come for that lottery where they where they auctioned that kind of stuff off you know oh. that, that that stuff is really awful so I, I was sort of curious to see how i was going to be treated and, and then where they put us off to the side at first in maine uh and then basically at some point they came over with the bullhorn truck and declared us on the side where they told us we'd be okay they declared us an unlawful assembly and then they decided that they were just going to take and march through the street, and they started coming and running after us with billy clubs and chased us through the streets for like a half an hour. <laughs> and God. and only you know I couldn't really keep up when they when they basically every every street that they turned on the cops were there. And there came a point when I just knew that I wasn't going to be able to keep up with them, and I heard that they ended up having to hop over fences and stuff. And a few got away, and probably about fifty of them got arrested. Uh, because I sort of ducked into an entryway of an apartment building and sort of pretended like I just walked out of my house and like, oh, what's going on? Right. And I got, got behind the line that was kettling them in and, and got away. But a lot of those people are still not even out of, uh, of jail in Los Angeles because they're held on $5,000 bail. Yeah, I was watching, I was just watching Freedom's Ustream before I came here and she was inter she's interviewing people as they come out and it, She did an them. interview with uh, Grandma Ruth. So right, like, uh, exactly. Oh. Yeah, it was a really good interview actually. Um, so I and I was watching um, Spencer's stream, uh, you know, like the early, you know, really late, like when it was down to the tree people, <laughs> and he was uh, covering. The tree house. Oh, tree house. <laughs> they were great, um, and uh, he had. They were to, right outside of Vera Gosa's office, right there. Yeah, yeah, and when he first got there, they're yelling all of this stuff from the trees, and it was just. Amazing. And then they shot him with beanbags. Right, and, and right, food. and he co Spencer covered that whole thing. I mean, at first we were like, you know, we didn't know if there were beanbags or rubber bullets, and then, you know, and I think there were, there was definitely three, but maybe four shots, and I mean, the guy who came out was saying that maybe he broke his arm, so, I mean, I don't know if we know the extent of those injuries yet. Yeah, I've been asking Freedom to keep me updated. And there was this, this wild rumor that was flying around that people were being DNA swabbed on the spot as they were being arrested. Right. But I've, I've, I've talked to a couple of people who tweeted when they came out who said that, the, that nobody that they knew had that happen. Okay. And that was some sort of uber paranoia for the most part. Right. So hopefully people see this and stop asking about it. <laughs> 
So anyway, I, I'm, I'm still going to keep up with it, but you know, as far as I know, that that was that, that was false. And and the one guy I think he probably saw a couple of times. There was a, sort of a, an older uh, Caucasian uh, commander who was sort of the liaison between the Occupy there and uh, and and uh, and uh, right, and, right. And, and at every at every occasion I had, he was probably the, the the best and most positive experience I've had with a police officer. In, yeah, in he was he, incredibly he was professional. Yeah, and he was very forthright on what he could and couldn't say, and uh, especially the first night when he's like, we're not here to raise you, we're just here to get you guys out of the street when, when, when traffic comes for the morning rush hour. And it was exactly what happened. Everything went down peaceful. And that first night, they did show great restraint. I mean, out of the corner of first and main of that big cluster of, uh, of protesters flew like three PVC pipes that hit like a couple officers. In Oakland, that would have been an excuse to toss tear gas and shoot people down with rubber bullets and stuff. And they didn't do anything but, like, take out the, the people that they saw throw the stuff, and that was it. Right. So, I mean, Sunday night went very differently than, 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 than the night a couple yeah, nights later. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear Spencer reacting to that, having come from the experience of the Oakland raids. Um, it, it definitely was a contrast. Now, apparently, there's reports coming out that the people in detention were not treated very well. Uh, I, I've been hearing that as well. I mean, not not anything firsthand, but a couple of people that have written some blog posts. Yeah, Yasha Levine wrote something for the Exiles. You know, he was arrested, and so yeah, he he wrote something about it. Um, yeah. So anyway, so that so at that point, um, Spencer had gone through his batteries and was to his phone by that point yeah. of the evening, and he had to put his stuff down. He had to put his camera down to do something, and you could see him, and he had like. A tear gas mask around his neck. Like, are you guys getting that? Did uh, well, you have I, one? I, I don't have a tear gas mask yet, but uh, okay. I, but there's somebody. Uh, I think they're called Big Eye or Oh Giant Eyes at Giant Eye, uh, who's been uh, selling these uh, Guy Fox bandanas on Etsy, and for every one that they sell on Etsy, they donate to uh, one to the movement. And so what I've got is uh, my Guy Fox bandana that sort of goes around like this. Oh, very uh, good. Yeah, and so if it ever comes down to where we think there's going to be tear gas, I'll soak this thing in uh, Wait, apple So you haven't been whatever. in tear gas? You haven't uh, been tear yeah. gassed? Uh, no, I was tear gassed uh, the very first raid in Oakland on, whatever that was, the 25th of October or something like that, I think. Okay. Uh, it, it might it may have been before that. Uh, but it was the very first raid. Uh, they basically told everybody that they could be on that corner of 14th and Broadway across from the plaza. And uh, the first load of tear gas went off, and uh, I asked them, why Why are you tear gassing us? Because it basically looked like they didn't throw it even into the park. They threw it into the middle of the intersection so it would hit all of the media, so the media would scatter, and they could go in under the cover of darkness. And they shut the big floodlight off and went in under, under cover of darkness, and I'm sure that they must have roughed up a bunch of people in the dark. I saw a few people being roughed up as I was running from the tear gas. But I was like, why, why the F are you guys tear gassing us? And the cop looked at me and goes, that's you guys tear gassing us. Right. The, the chief the chief admitted that they tear gassed uh, in the press conference after, but they, the, 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 what, what apparently happened was they didn't tell their mutual aid departments that they were going to be using tear gas, so they didn't come prepared for it. So mutual aid was un tear gas mask, but the Oakland PD had their own tear gas mask and knew that that was what they planned on doing. Right. <laughs> Right. Yeah, that's insane. So, okay. So where do you see things going um, in the Bay Area? I mean, do you feel like the occupations are strong, that they're going to keep growing there? I think, yeah. I mean, as much as there's this whole sort of uh, substantive phobia of, of tents, uh, the way I sort of look at it is, 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 is they're not so much scared of the tent. It's not a public health hazard. People have been living in tents and huts for thousands of years. There's not going to be a bubonic plague starting out. I mean, it's possible that tuberculosis or something like that could spread, especially as the winter months come. But that that that's you know that's that's not as that's not very likely. But because of all the you know antibiotics and superbugs, I mean, that is a little bit of something to worry about. Right. But in my opinion, they're most afraid of it because they've carved out in our society a way of keeping us all separate in our own little apartments in our own little separate ways and they only want us to hear what they have to say through the corporate television machine so they want us to all be separate to go from the box of our house to the box of our car to the box of our work and do what they conditioned us to do to make the one percent money and so us coming together in these little communities in these little ad hoc villages 
uh, is very dangerous to them because they don't want that togetherness because there is strength in, in being in physical contact and being around people and, and being in a community where you don't have to know everybody's name because you can just call everybody brother or sister and, and nobody's going to get mad at you for it. Like, you know, if you call somebody brother on the street, they'll be like, you know, they'll get in your face or something. But, you know, it's just like in the Rainbow Family. That's why they call themselves the Rainbow Family. So you don't need to know everybody. Everybody's name. You can call each other brother and sister. Um, and the other thing that, that really gets me is, uh, you know, a lot of the excuses that they used in Oakland was, oh, there was a shooting near the camp or there was drug abuse going on in the camp. You know, these are the ills that are visited upon the society as a whole right now. So, and, and the occupations being sort of a microcosm of society as a whole, you know, you can't blame all of society's ills on us because being a microcosm, those ills are, are, are what we're trying to, to fix. And so those ills are going to be in the occupations, no doubt. There's going to be a lot of shenanigans. There's some people who just show up because it's a free place or, you know, because they can smoke pot openly or something. Uh, but you can't blame that on the occupation. And there, there's people doing things that, that are trying to change it. I don't know really what the end game of the Occupy movement is because a lot of it seems to be based on economic justice right now. But I think that that cannot be separated from the environmental justice that has to be going down uh, because without nature there is no economy so you know we really need to help save the planet and uh, uh, you said what's next in the Bay Area uh, so on December 12th in, in the spirit of the general strike in Oakland and the shutting down of the Oakland port we've got pretty much every city on the west coast on board for shutting down the whole side of this of this continent uh, as far as ports go and, and uh, they're going to lose billions of dollars that day and hopefully that that will be a little bit of a warning shot that we are powerful and they need to start listening to us and stop mocking us and and we do have legitimate uh, uh, gripes of, of what's going on in society and uh, you know the sooner they come and uh, join with us the sooner this will all be over and everybody will be much better off right right uh yeah could you um the other day scott olson um was interviewed a couple of different times for the first I think time. I think Rachel Maddow, and he'll be on Oberman again. He'll be on Oberman actually being interviewed tonight, so I'm, I'm anxious to see him. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I do remember meeting him briefly once. I think I was just introduced to him once at Occupy SF. Mm -hmm. um, and when I saw him uh, being interviewed by Indie Bay, and he talked about how he started out at Occupy SF, and when he went over to Oakland, he sort of uh, felt more of an affinity with how Oakland was doing things. And as and it's bad of a reputation as Oakland had, the first time I went down there was when I knew they were under threat of a raid on the on a Friday. And I, I felt the same way. I thought that Oakland was doing a very amazing thing. There's a lot of homeboys. There's a lot of gangbangers. There's a lot of, you know, Oakland's a pretty violent city for the most part. And I didn't go over there very often. But just to see that a lot of those people had put down their arms and wanted to join in in a community like that. And, and you know, not calling it so much Occupy Oakland for the most part. But right there when you walk into it, it said Oakland Commune. And it was a commune. They had garden. They had they had a huge working kitchen. It, was, it seemed that it was much more organized than, than uh, Occupy SF sort of been. I mean, not not to their discredit. I mean, they've had to deal with things a little bit differently over here. And it, and that's that's the nice thing about Occupy. Is it's sort of you know it's it's not about mimicking the exact same movement in every city. It's sort of adapting it to to, to the environment and to the culture of, of your own individual city. And and just because of how harsh of a, a neighborhood uh, lots of parts of Oakland are. Um, you know, just it was just that much more beautiful to see the teach-ins and, and the little school that they had going and the little kitty village. And it was it, it was basically a small city there. Yeah, yeah. And I was horrified to see how, how, how the police took it out with, like, in this giant paramilitary action. It was just disgusting how, 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 they, how, the, how they basically just tried to discredit everything. And, and for a long time, the mainstream media would, wouldn't do anything to cover any of the positive aspects. I still haven't seen any mainstream like spend uh, spend a day, spend a night at a GA and explain the process and explain what people are actually doing at the occupation. They cover they cover the the, the, the stuff we have to deal with politically with the city governments and oh and they just call them protesters but they don't actually show the parts of the society and the, and the sort of sovereign uh, what what is inherently at heart an anarchist movement even though right. they seem to only want to use that word anarchist with vandalism and, and all this. Negativity, but it is inherently in the anarchist movement. It's the leader. The, uh, I think the, the best way I heard it put was at Occupy uh, Los Angeles uh, General Assembly. I think it was Monday or Tuesday, and they said, "We are not a leaderless movement. We are a movement of leaders." Right. 
I thought that was very eloquent and beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, the main, in terms of the mainstream media, I mean, for me, they just, you're right, I mean, they are very out of touch with what's happening with it. And to me, now that the streams are happening and the Twitter feeds are happening, the it's just almost weird to watch it covered on the mainstream media. Like, they'll report yeah. things a week after the fact, or, you know, you'll just be like, are they talking about something different? <laughs> what? <laughs> so, so one of the things I've used the mainstream media for, at least, is I, I still record a lot, especially when I know that there's something going down. But originally when I first started covering stuff, and, uh, and, and after that first night when I went down to Occupy Oakland with that big Occupy Citizens Media sticker on my back, and all the mainstream media ran up to me thinking I was a press liaison or something. Oh. So I got, so I made friends with a lot of video journalists, especially a lot of the people at KTVU are actually really, really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, for the most part, many of the journalists, uh, like Janet Katayama, uh, there's, there's a few more that I can't think of, um, and, and especially their video journalists who caught some of the most amazing footage of, of those actions that the police had in Oakland with the tear gas and everything. Right. Love themselves to put their their you know put their asses on the line to to, to get a good uh, to get good shots of of how it was going down and. And I've had some really good talks with them, and even uh, Alan Wong from uh, ABC7 here, like when, when we were waiting for the cops to move in at uh, Occupy Cal for the second day, the second raid that happened that first day where the, where the kids got beat with the one that went viral, uh, he's just like, what, what did the cops have to accomplish? He says, well, they realize that every time they do this, they just come back with more people. It's sort of pointless. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the reporters get it. I know they've got a lot of people above them who edit their stuff down. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I've used sort of my watching of the mainstream media to know which reporters are just kissing up to me when I'm there to get information out of me and which ones actually, you know, the way that they've seen stuff covered is the way that they actually portray it when it, when it hits the air. So there's right. a few reporters that I just won't talk to anymore because they just seem like they, they have no nothing but contempt for having to be assigned to go down there. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't name any names, but, you know, those people I won't talk to anymore. But I basically use it as sort of a trust but verify. Like, I'll talk to them, and then I'll watch to see how they reported on stuff and make sure that they weren't using stuff I told them in any bad way for me. Right. Well, I think got you a lot guys of, I've got are, a lot of reporters on speed dial now. I think you guys are doing the important stuff. Um, I really do. Um, it's, I think yeah, it's, it's history making. It's, it's sort of amazing because, you know, I, I never really felt comfortable. Uh, the, you know, I always felt a fit, an affinity for for, uh, for taking pictures, for photography, for, for writing. And all of these things I thought I'd be doing when I was a kid that I realized I didn't want to do in, in mainstream and for money because the few jobs I had as a photographer just made me feel dirty. That I, I, felt, like a, I felt like I was hooking myself for, 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 for a dollar, using my creativity for this dirty money stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I basically just sort of, you know, through serendipity, carved out a niche, and I'm doing all the things that I knew I was going to do when I was a kid, and I have done it on my own. And so, are you loving it? Or are you just having a class? I'm so loving it. <laughs> I mean, I don't do it out of ego. I, do, I just do it because it needs to be done. And, and uh, you know, I know a lot of people have, have thanked me over and over, and there's those, that sort of Freedom Fighter Fridays, and just every Friday, just to see all the people who appreciate everything I'm doing, it just means the world. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I think you guys are doing just absolutely amazing work, and I hope that um, I'll, I'll link some information about how people can donate. Um, All right. Both I'm going to be setting up. There's just a few little pieces of equipment that I think I could still benefit from having. That uh, right. I'm going to set up a wish list uh, on Amazon. I'll try to yeah. I'll it around to when I get home tonight. I'm sort of. I've, I've had the most erratic sleep schedule for the last few months. I know. So, I was going to interview Spencer today, too, and he is just wiped out. I mean, you oh, guys yeah, yeah. were in L.A., and then you were both going to sleep last night, and then there was the raid. The, the, they thought yeah. there was going to be a raid. And I can never fall asleep before, like, 4.30 or 5 in the morning because I know that that's when all the actions usually come down as a surprise. So it's like not till 5 o'clock do I finally, like, keep myself up and go, okay, they're safe for now. Right. I, and, and, and knowing that we were down in LA, I just like crossed my fingers. I had a lot of people who, who have started streaming, uh, sort of, you know, said that I was the reason that they started, and they're just trying to get the handle of it and everything. So like, right. I got a hold of all those people, and I said, "Can you cover if something does happen to happen?" That would I would have felt awful if something went down in my home city when we were down there covering the other people down there. Right. I um, you know, I I hope you know. You said you're not you're you're not you're trying not to react to the police officers anymore, but. Hard I think it's imp I think it's important because you know I've been really blown away by watching peaceful protesters be brutalized 
Yeah. And I think if you really, if you watch it particularly on the streams, and if you watch it as it's happening, I don't know. I, for me, like that was one of the only sane things I've seen is to see somebody actually react. Yeah, and and I mean, if I'm if, if for some reason some cop tackles me, I don't know that I'm going to be able to just not, you know, struggle or try to get away. I mean, it's just instinct. It's something that kicks in in your in your fight or flight mechanism. So. Right. I mean, I, I commend all these people who could just sit there like if it's in, in UC Davis, but I, I don't know that that would be my nature to just kind of sit back and let it happen. Yeah, well, I mean, you I mean, definitely... I, I'm, a total, I'm a total pacifist, but if it comes down to self-defense, I have no problem taking a swing, but, you know, those people have got guns and stuff, so I, I, I may end up eventually getting into a little bit of trouble, but I've tried my best to stay out of it. Well, so far, that... it was just verbal reaction, but it, it was, I mean... I don't know. It first, was first amendment first amendment exercises. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And and then also, you know, and I'll repost this. I actually posted on my blog yesterday, but and you mentioned that Russia today had picked it up, but Spencer reacting to the police that's officer. That's not that's not necessary officer. <laughs> exactly. It's against yeah. procedure. You're violating yeah, procedure. And, and he calls them out on it. And people, yeah. people 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 are so good in my chat room about like you know, uh, uh, oh no, and then they put it in the chat room section, uh, 502 something, something, something. And, you know, any officer can be held personally liable for any action he does, even if he's under orders and, and those types of things. So, right. so people are awesome. And people who are listening to like the scanner feeds and, and feeding me like they're coming here or they're going to do this. Oh, it, don't run down this street because they just got orders to go block up that street when we're being chased through the street. And it was a little hard to be like doing this and, and, and trying to read the chat while like booking through the streets, but. Right. So I really, and I still, I really want to interview, I'm going to interview Spencer, I think, Monday or Tuesday, and I really want to interview also Tim Poole and Freedom. Um, Tell him to get high. Like, I will, I, 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 I will. I have really interaction with him. He's been so busy in his sort of celebrity, you know, his, our sort of, you know, serendipitous celebrity. Uh, I think I think Jenny of uh, Boing Boing put it uh, really uh, appropriately when she was reporting on uh, the Madeline Brand show, which is just like, all it takes is one event, one sought-after story that you're the only news outlet to sort of gain this huge following. And that's, yeah. that's, sort, of, that's sort of what it's been for all three of us. I was the only person covering the, the first couple of raids live on right. uh, down here at Occupy SF. And uh, Spencer, that night that it all blew up, the night of the strike in Oakland, and Tim Poole just happened to have you know, his camera raid. record and rolling during the Zuccotti raid. And we've all just gathered our following from there and, and have sort of, you know, just been down and, and around as much as possible. And I know I'm sort of guilty of the police that leads thing by covering raids so much, but it's also a very important thing. And now that I'm getting my equipment together and I've got more batteries, and I, I, I've got at least uh, 12 to 16 hours of battery power now, so I'm going to be making an effort to, to cover the other stuff too a lot more than just than just, have it, have, you know, just covering the raids, even though I know that that's really important. To, because it is, like Spencer said, we're the buffer between the cops doing something when they just, when they think they can get away with it and when they don't. Right. Yeah, I, I would really let, you know, you mentioned Oakland, like just how, you know, the o Oakland commune and just kind of the feel of it. And I remember early, early on, Naomi Klein went and visited San Francisco and Oakland, and she was really blown away by Oakland. Like everybody, yeah, a, a lot, place. yeah, a lot of people really mentioned um, the services that were provided at Oakland and just the feel of Oakland. And the pictures that I saw of it, um, it just looks so diverse too. Yeah, it was it was amazing. I mean, there was everything from the from the rainbow and the hippie kids and 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 some gangbangers that just sort of you know threw away their gang affiliations to sort of be there. I, I, I'm assuming I'm speculating, uh, but you know there was like you know sort of uh, baby mamas and with their kids and you know just everybody taking care of each other and that's what it's all about. I mean, we, we, the society has become so me first in the gimme gimmies, you know. <sighs> And, 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 and you're judged by how much credit you have and how much money and, and products you can buy. And everybody's got giant televisions. And, and it's all about just keeping us all separate and having a filtered view of the world through that television society. And that's one of the other things that I love about, uh, about streaming is I've got that chat room that I'm able to respond. And it's an interactive experience. It's not just me right. spouting off stuff and people just watching uh, you know, blankly. You know, they're they're there with me. They feel like they're they're living vicariously through my camera. And, and do you have like a core of people who are continually there? Yeah, there, there's there's people like there's there's uh, another uh, guy out of Tennessee called the Really Rick who's been following me for quite a long time. He, he, he sort of bugs Spencer, but he he did a good video that they put up. Uh, if you go to, oh, I mean, 
to see if I could figure out uh, how, it, how it's spelled. Um, but uh, our little guild that we're starting to follow is, uh, is, uh, to, to, to form is uh, CITZ for citizens, CITZ Media Guild, all one word as, uh, as a Twitter handle. Uh, but uh, they, if you go to their uh, CITZ, trying to find their that's uh, not working for me. But uh, on their website, and uh, if, even if you just go to YouTube and do a search for Punk Boy NSF, like there'll be a, a video by the Really Breakers just talking about how me, Spencer, and Tim have been like, you know, not listening to the cops and. And, and like somebody else said, I think it was on Democracy Now! the other day, they said, you know, what is with these mainstream uh, media people who, when the cops say you can't cover this or go to this free speech zone over here to do your coverage, like when the cops tell you to turn your camera off, that's when you turn it on. Right, right, <laughs> and, exactly. And, and everybody has cameras. I mean, my mother actually uh, commented on who actually, she actually, she lived in Haight-Ashbury in 67. Uh, <laughs> she, um, commented that you know i live on h street (laughs) oh do you that there i think she actually she actually lived in sausalito at the at the time but she was in the she was there (laughs) uh and i'm i'm from sacramento i i grew up like nine miles from davis and then my father worked then in silicon valley so i'm a northern california girl so i'm really following everything I was born in Castro Valley. I was raised in Hayward and San Lorenzo. Most of my family lives in Pleasanton, so I, I'm a Bay Area boy. I've got revolution in my blood on my paternal grandfather's side. I've got two uh, founding fathers, uh, Robert and Lewis Morris. And Robert Morris wrote that uh, preamble to the Constitution. Oh, that wow. we the, that, that we the people stuff is, uh, right. is one of my ancestors. So. Very cool. That's so very I'm cool. hoping we have a new constitutional Congress soon because uh, we're way overdue for one. <laughs> is there a movement for that there? I don't think so. I know that uh, early declarations I saw coming out of Occupy Los Angeles uh, that when, they, when they weren't under threat of raid, it seems that the, 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 all this raid threat has basically sort of thrown all of our main goals into sort of uh, side fear for the most part right now. Right. Uh, but so as far as Occupy SF goes, they, they did put out a declaration. It's on their uh, OccupySF.org or .com site. Uh, and, and part of the declaration, it seems every city is sort of taking on their own issues. So, like, New York had their big, big statement out of GA, the one that uh, Keith Olbermann read. Uh, Washington, D.C., because they've got a lot of uh, legal people and political people involved there. Uh, what I heard was when the super committee was meeting, they came out with their sort of economic uh, super committee, sort of occupied super committee declaration, which by, by the, the people that I saw analyzing it, the economist, I think it was on Olbermann, uh, said that it's, it was pretty conservative and, and very workable. It was, it, if anything, it was too comprehensive to ever get passed through. Right, right. Uh, Occupy Los Angeles sort of had a more broader sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater, which is sort of, you know, my personal my personal goal would be to do that, to just sort of uh, wipe out the whole system and sort of start it over properly. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know a lot of people don't feel that way. They just sort of want to bandage, uh, to, to put little band-aids on it and, and at least get, at least in the short term. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what's, what I've seen San Francisco come out of their, their declaration is, uh, having a huge homeless population, which has been more and more sort of swept under the rug, and this, I think it was a 70%-ish uh, margin, this, uh, this city measure, the sit-lie law, where it's basically not illegal to sit or lie down anywhere in the city on the sidewalk or in a park or anything. Mm-hmm. So there, there's been this sort of uh, the war waged on the homeless here. So their, their declaration is uh, addressing things like substance abuse, mental illness, uh, homelessness. So that's sort of the San Francisco cause that they've taken up for the moment, mm-hmm. uh, along right. with the economic and, and social justice kind of uh, banner that, that, that flies over all of us at this point. Right. So is there anything you want to add just to wrap up? <sighs> I don't know. What didn't we cover? <laughs> <laughs> I think we did pretty good. Um, how do How would people... It, you know, is this something that just anybody can start doing, live streaming anywhere from? Yeah, anybody with the smartphones, uh, Android and iPhone, there's that Ustream app. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's, a little, it's a little helpful to do it on a, on a full PC or Mac uh, just to open your account because I, I think as far as uh, you could set up the, the Ustream account, but as far as uh, linking it to your Twitter and Facebook so that it will automatically send out a tweet and a status update when you go live, uh, so download the app. Make sure it's installed. Uh, use your use your, your regular browser to set up the app, uh, the, the account to, your, to link it to your Twitter and your Facebook. And when you broadcast, just make sure uh, when when you start the app, 
uh, if you tell it that you're going to go live, there's always a little line at the bottom that says, what are you broadcasting or what's your show? Just make sure that that hashtag with the occupation that you're broadcasting from is there so that when people go to Ustream and then just search the word Occupy, Occupy, all the, all the Occupy stuff that are, that's live will just show up in that search. That right. was all I did was I put hashtag, I put hashtag Occupy stuff there and, uh, and, and that, I had, you know, 200 viewers that first night and I had never broadcast it before and didn't have anybody following. It was just people on Twitter were getting raided, so they went to, you know, they went to the streaming sites to see if there was anything there. And, the, and there you, you know, were. <laughs> exactly. Um, and my, well, my poor dog, I was juggling my poor dog and my What camera. kind of dog is he? He looks like my aunt's dog. He's a chihuini. Let me pull him out again. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, so he's about 17 pounds. He's a Chihuahua Dachshund mix. Oh, okay. His name, his name is Spielberg. He's three and a half. He uh, he was a rescue. I, I think he was a little abused. He's very skittish a lot. So he was terrified that first night. I'm sort of juggling him with one hand and, and holding up the phone with the other. Right, right. And, and at that point, I didn't really want to be known. So I I had my full guy box mask over my head and everything. Uh huh. So the first couple of raids in San Francisco, I had that guy Fox Master, so I just couldn't breathe, and then I was just like, they know who I am. I'm like, not trying to hide anymore, because I'm sure, you know, I don't know if I'm being over paranoid, but I think that, you know, with all these bills going through Congress and everything, I, I know they're probably watching us. Yeah, probably. Um, and all the cops are watching our live stream and getting our intel. That, that the, the night after the, the raid in Oakland, when they were wandering through the streets, and it was uh, uncertain whether they were going to try to get onto the Bay Bridge to come over when they shut the park stations down. Yeah. Uh, uh, we thought we were getting raided over here, and they they took a moment to smoke out our Twitter intel. They they noticed that uh, people were tweeting up pictures that they were being followed in their in their muni bus full of officers across the bridge, mm-hmm. and they stopped like two thirds of the way back to their command center. And they're just like they're pulling over, they're stopping, they're just sitting there. What the, what the heck's going on? And then all of a sudden they were like on them. So they they're, oh. they're not done. They're following the social media. They know what we're doing. Right. Okay. I so. Um, I just want to thank you for meeting with us. I want to, after I, I'm going to stop the recording, and then I want him to talk to you really briefly. And so, but I will thank you so much for meeting with us, and we no will post your Twitter feed and um, what so other equipment you want and how people, and your Ustream uh, feed for everybody. We'll make sure to link those. And thank okay. you so much for meeting with us. All right, thank you.